what's going on little dragons how are you feeling today if you're feeling good please do let me know down in the comments below drop a like on this video share this video with your friends and family and don't forget to help punch that subscribe button as it will help your little dragon out so very much today we are going back into history man checking out more history videos another subscriber request West, somebody requested for me to react to this down in the comments below a previous video so hey you know we love these we love these we love learning and you know i love making videos i love learning i love watching videos so yeah it basically all of these fall into place when i'm reacting to an educational video and i'm putting it out here for you guys to enjoy as much as i am so hey as well as me so when China was ruled by warlords, the, okay, I don't know if I'm going to say this right, but hey, Zili Anhui War, and this is from the channel The Great War, man, we've seen a video from this channel before, this channel is amazing, man, it's a guy, I think this was the channel where there's um, a guy talking and explaining, like, everything, you know, everything out there. God, these sort of things, man, we're lucky to be living in this time and age where we can understand, learn, and, you know, review these sort of things with the comfort of just staying in our own home, literally just typing a few letters on our phone, and we can learn about the whole world from, you know, all times. I'm sure this is from, like, I, th I think I, I don't know, but when China was ruled, I'm guessing, I might be wrong, I might be wrong. I'm just taking like an educated guess. This is from like early 1900s. I'm sure it's like 1900, probably like somewhere from before like World War One and Two. So somewhere before that, early 1900s. Could be anything, man. Could be anything. But yeah, very interesting. Pretty long video, so we're not gonna waste too much time. And hopefully I don't pause it as much. I'm trying not to pause it at all. But if there is an ad or something, then, you know, we have to. But yes, I'm very excited to learn. So yeah, what are we waiting for, man? Let's hop right in. Boom. Let's go. <sighs> Great Lord. Hopefully not too much death, hopefully. By Curiosity Street. So go to curiositystream.com slash the great war and you can sign up. There's okay. more information in the video description below and at the end of this video. Check it out. It's April 1921 and in the southern Chinese city of Guangzhou, 1921, okay, early 1900s, all right. A new government separate from Beijing. But in reality, Sun is just one of dozens of autonomous leaders competing for power in the age of the Chinese warlord. Hopefully not too much death. Hi, I'm Jesse Alexander and welcome to the Great War. In the early 1920s, China was in the throes of a chaotic and violent period dominated by regional warlords. The old empire was gone, replaced by rival factions and military leaders attempting to wow. both unify China rituals. and protect their independence at the same time. Some Chinese contemporaries compared the period to the turbulent and romanticized era of ancient Chinese history known as the Three Kingdoms. 1,700 years later, China was in the grips of warlords once again, and in this episode, we'll take a look at how that came to be, who were the major players, and the first important war between them. And it all happened exactly 100 years ago. At the start of the 20th century, Chinese society was searching for answers to problems that the country had not been able to solve for decades. China had not been fully colonized by the European powers, but they'd the taken control of several during the Boxer Rebellion. cities and forced the imperial government to accept humiliating trade deals. To add to China's misery, the country suffered defeat in a war against Japan in 1895. Oh. 
the humiliation of this defeat very accelerated the process of change Nika. and the promotion yes. of new ideas about how to restore China's full sovereignty. A Western-inspired free press was questioning traditional Confucian values, while military officers and intellectuals, many of whom had been educated in European academies, brought back republican sentiments. Many Chinese were now calling for the overthrow of the imperial Qing dynasty, which had ruled the country for more than 250 years. Chief among the critics was Sun Yat-sen. Sun was born in southern China, but spent much of his early life in Hawaii, where he received a Western education. After returning to China as a teenager, he established the revolutionary Kuomintang Party in 1894, which called for a US-style republic. Oh my days. So now it's an ad. Okay. Oh well, can't say too much yet because it's only just, you know, started to started to, you know, heat up. We've just got that friction, now it's gonna light up. But yeah, it's a lot of these uh the politics, politicians, like the, the leaders. They're they're the main like cause well it, it's basically them and civilians get stuck between all of this. Hopefully my heart doesn't break. Let's go. Okay, boom. According to Sun, the lack of a united Chinese national identity was a source of its backwardness. The Chinese people have shown the greatest loyalty to family and clan, with the result that in China there have been familyism and clanism, but no real nationalism. Foreign observers say that the Chinese are like a sheet of loose sand. Mm -hmm. The volatile situation in China came to a head in October 1911. What started as a local army revolt in Wuhan quickly grew to a full-on rebellion, and one by one, China's strongmen in the provinces began to declare their independence. The National Beiyang Army under General Yuan Shikai proved unable or unwilling to put a stop to the disintegration of the empire. In February 1912, the boy emperor Pu Yi abdicated, and Sun Yat-sen was provisionally declared the first president of the Chinese Republic. So after centuries of kingdom and empire, China was now a republic, mm. but President Sun had little power. Many of the provinces were de facto independent, and General Yuan was an influential figure in Beijing. Sun was unable to form a stable government, and so he handed over control to General Yuan in April 1912. The transfer of power from Sun to Yuan had been planned, but there were Republican revolutionaries who were concerned that their new leader might not share their principles, and they had good reason to worry. Yuan took personal control in the capital in part by requiring army generals to be personally loyal to him. He even tried to get Japanese loans to pay for an expansion of the army. But Yuan caused even more controversy in December 1915 when he took the extraordinary step of declaring himself emperor. This decision caused an uproar. Leaders of important provinces like Yunnan declared their independence and even Yuan's beloved army began to turn against him. Uh -oh. As one historian explained, it would be difficult to find a parallel case of reverse of popular opinion so swift and so complete. Yuan was forced to renounce his throne in March 1916, and his fall from grace was only interrupted by his unexpected death in June. Oh. Power now rested in the hands of Prime Minister Duan Qiri, who okay. immediately tried to gain favor with the army. Another priority for Prime Minister Duan was trying to convince his countrymen that China should join in the First World War. The war had arrived early in China as Japanese troops allied with Britain besieged the German colony of Qingdao in September 1914. China also sent around 140,000 workers to France, but by 1917, the country was still officially neutral. 
Duan now called for a full-on declaration of war. His supporters claimed if China could be part of an Allied victory, they might be able to recover the German colonies and prevent Japan from seizing them instead. Sun Yat-sen and his Republican supporters in the South were opposed to the plan. Sun broke from Beijing and consolidated his power in the South, which severely weakened the Republic. Duan finally got his declaration of war in August 1917 and quickly began developing the Chinese War Participation Army for service in Europe. In secret, the Japanese also agreed to loan money, arm, and train China's expeditionary force, but Duan knew it would likely never be sent to France. What he was actually doing was creating an army for his own purposes, and he used it for the first time in January 1918 to suppress yet another revolt in Hunan province. The end of the Great War brought disappointment for Duan and his government since the Allies gave the Japanese the former German colonies in China. When Duan accepted the Versailles Treaty in spite of Japan's gains, mass student protests erupted in May 1919. These became known as the May 4th Movement, which would last for several years and have an important political and cultural impact on the country. For the moment though, Duan used his new army, which he'd renamed the Frontier Defense Army, to retain power. So by 1919, Prime Minister Duan held a tenuous grip on power, but was struggling with breakaway provinces and the May 4th student movement. He also had problems within the army, as Duan's attempts at autocratic rule had caused disgruntled officers to form dissident groups known as cliques. As time passed and the situation remained unstable, influential military officers and politicians began to form numerous cliques. In theory, the army officers and politicians in these loosely organized groups were under orders from the central government in Beijing. But in practice, they exercised territorial control, often by having one of their members named as governor of a particular province. Many different cliques rose and fell during the warlord period, including the famous Anhui, Zhili, and Feng Tian cliques. In 1919, the Anhui clique was by far the strongest. It was Anhui. led by Duan himself and controlled much of coastal China and the provinces around Beijing. But mm -hmm. some of its provinces were only accessible via railways that ran through rival territory. Anhui enjoyed the support of key army officers and the Japanese, who provided Duan with 120 million Chinese dollars in funding and sent advisors to train his troops. Mm. This meant that the Frontier Defense Army's four divisions formed the Anhui clique's supposedly elite formation. The Zhili clique centered on Beiyang National Army officers Cao Kun and Wu Pei Fu and dominated several provinces in east-central China. Wu eventually became the most prominent member of the GB clique. He was known for his interest in traditional arts, which earned him the nicknames the Scholar Warlord, or the Jade Marshal. Zhili's military power centered on the Third Division, and it also had foreign backers, as Italy provided arms and ammunition. The third major clique was Feng Tian, which was based around bandit-turned-warlord Zhang Zolin and controlled most of the provinces in northeastern Manchuria. Known as the Tiger of the North, Zhang had originally fought against the revolution, but now acted to balance the power of the other cliques. Proximity to Japan meant that the Japanese took an interest in Feng Tian and hoped to influence Zhang through gifts of cash and weapons. It's important to note that there were many more cliques and warlords besides just these three. For example, Sun Yat-sen's clique controlled two provinces in the south, Yunnan province was essentially independent, okay. and Sichuan province was divided up into even smaller fiefdoms. So Republican China was split between cliques under rival warlords. This was a process that took several years to develop. But by 1919, yeah, but, uh, the age of high warlordism had
had definitively arrived. Now the term warlord has come to define this era of Chinese history, but not all warlords were alike. Some warlords were hardly known outside their local area, while others rose to yeah. national They don't have news and stuff back then. Infamy. An important part and I'm not of saying much. was nicknames. Some were flattering, like the model governor, and others were just descriptive, like the Christian warlord. Already had Some news were papers, comical, but like well, Zhang Zongchang, who was as, sometimes as... known as the dog meat general. Zhang's other nickname was the three don't knows because he reportedly didn't know how much money, troops, or concubines he had. Other notable warlord nicknames included the two-headed snake and the rotten pig. These nicknames actually had several important functions. Hmm? They were a clue for civilians about the governing style of the new warlord in their area, and about. they allowed for better identification. Hmm. Warlords were constantly Smart. changing. And many of them had several different names in accordance with Chinese tradition. That code. These nicknames allowed people to understand who was talking about whom. Yeah. In general, warlords gained and kept political power by controlling armies that were loyal to them personally, not to the state. Betrayal was common, and a good warlord made sure only his most trusted supporters were close to him. Some warlords did try to govern in the public interest. The model governor I mentioned earlier brought in extensive social reforms, and Wu Pei Fu of the Zhili clique tried to promote cultural enlightenment. Wu often showed off his poetry and calligraphy skills, and some other warlords Chinese calligraphy, bro. I love philosophical Chinese calligraphy. Even the dog meat general wrote poetry, I'm not good at it. and one of the poems attributed to him might give us an indication of his artistic style. A poem about bastards. Oh. You tell me to do this. He tells me to do that. You're all bastards. Oh. Go f your mother. So the hey, warlords hey. running most of China could span the range from angry poets to effective governors. Oh, that's not a poem. Ultimately, warlords were expected to fight. That's just YouTube comments, I'm joking. Between ah, ah, there were 700 separate conflicts in China, with 500 in Sichuan province alone. Most conflicts were too small to even make the Chinese press, but warlords spent much of their time preparing for war. Although Chinese warlord armies were organized on 20th century Western lines on paper, in practice, they more closely resembled the peasant levies of centuries past. Mm. Most soldiers were landless peasants who joined for food or steady pay, although there were a fair number of criminals who joined as well. Pay was a constant problem, and men who weren't paid often defected, including in the middle of a battle. Local civilians were usually forced to pay taxes to support their warlord's troops, and sometimes they had to pay years in advance. What? Another source of income for soldiers' pay and weapons How? was the sale of opium. I don't have any money left. What do you in mean the years in advance? Around half a million men were serving in warlord armies, and this number rose to 1.2 million in 1922. I guess because the population is high. The of this number were actually reliable troops. Before any given battle or campaign, a warlord could perhaps expect about 25% of his men to actually fight. The remainder of the men who weren't fighting were often left to their own devices, and this sometimes led to the abuse of civilians. Extortion, murder, and arson were common, particularly in newly occupied villages. It was said that the Fengtian clique was especially prone to such crimes. One anti Fengtian newspaper made its frustration with the so-called army clear. The nation establishes an army to protect its people. Today, because of the army, the people have no way to protect themselves. Therefore, the original purpose in establishing an army has indeed been completely lost. The weapons of warlord China were quite diverse. 
Despite an official arms embargo, many European companies sold weapons to the warlords regardless of political considerations. Yeah. Most popular were older Great War pattern rifles like the Mauser, Mosin Nagant, and Arisaka. And the 1896 broom handle Mauser pistol what? became the iconic weapon of the period. That is so amazing. Machine guns and artillery that is so were amazing. relatively rare. With it's concealed. One of each for every it's not heavy. thousand men under arms. The German army in 1913, for example, had 16 times as many machine guns and more than six times as much artillery per man. British Stokes trench mortars were much more common, and Chinese factories even produced homemade copies. There were also a few armored vehicles, airplanes, and armored trains, but since they were too expensive to lose in battle, they mostly served to enhance the owner's prestige. When combat did occur, it was usually short and sharp. And since desertion was so common, commanders didn't trust their men on long campaigns away from home unless they had enough money to bribe them, a practice known as the silver bullet. During the fighting, which was sometimes under the watchful eye of an exiled white good. Russian advisor, the lack of machine guns and artillery was key. Damn. Infantry and cavalry charges could change the course of the battle, but only if the men could be persuaded to actually carry them out. Victory in battle often meant that the losing side would simply join the winning side afterwards. So by 1920, cliques all across China had been arming themselves for several years. For the most part, warlords tried to avoid the risk and expense of battle, but this was a situation that couldn't last forever. Mm. Early in 1920, tensions between the three biggest cliques finally boiled over. Duan's acceptance of the Versailles Treaty and renewed revolts in Hunan province helped to make him more and more unpopular. He was aware of this and renamed his army yet again, this time, ironically, as the National Pacification Army. War seems sure to come, as historian Edward Dreyer explained. Whatever their westernized educations, the warlords remained disciples of Sun Tzu rather than Clausewitz, and may be forgiven for imagining that those skilled in war subdue the enemy's army without battle. Fortunately, Clausewitz's famous analogy remains the last word. Like cash settlement in business, battle cannot be entirely avoided. Duan made the first move by expressing his intentions to move the forces of his Anhui clique against those of the Zhili clique. But the Zhili's had gained a new ally. The Fengtian clique agreed to join the Zhili clique against Hanhui, even though Feng Tuan and Anhui both enjoyed Japanese support. And that is how the first Zhili Anhui War began. Oh. Fighting broke out on July 14, 1920. The Zhili's 3rd Division converged at Baoding and moved to attack Beijing from the south. Civil War. Meanwhile, 70,000 Fengtian troops moved into the northern Anhui territories through the Shanghai Pass of the Great Wall. Wow. The fact that the Zhili's controlled Jiangsu province meant that the Anhui's couldn't use the railway to move badly needed reinforcements north from its southern provinces. The large but untested Anhui army marched to secure the capital against the Zhili's, yes, while I other see. troops were sent to deal with the Fengtians in the far north. Within four days, the war really was over. Yeah. Zhili forces performed a daring flanking maneuver and defeated the Anhui army at Zhuozhu, yeah. which the made the defense of Beijing for see. Prime Minister Duan untenable. The Anhui's National Pacification Army, supposedly the most elite in China, had failed to perform. Instead, Duan resigned and took refuge with the Japanese. Much of his defeated army went over to the Fengtian clique which now took control of Anhui's former northern provinces. Meanwhile, Zhili clique members 
now ruled most of China's central provinces. Oh, and we held on to a sliver of territory on the coast, but the once powerful clique was politically destroyed. Victory, however, did not bring stability, since the only thing that had united the Zhilis and the Fengtians was their war against Anhui. Mm. Now there was a common border between them, and the Zhili leader, Wu Peifu, felt that the Fengtians had benefited from his victory, and this was sure to increase tensions between them. So the Zhili and Fengtian cliques were now the most powerful groups in China after their victory over the Anhui. Yes, the oh, Zhili yeah. headed up a new national government which accepted that central control was no longer possible. Regional autonomy had become the status quo. The fragmentation of China was further reinforced in April 1921 with Sun Yat-sen's election as the extraordinary president of a self-proclaimed military government in Guangzhou. He believed, like many other warlords, that a unified China could only result from military success over all other cliques and factions. He therefore announced plans for a great northern expedition to reunite the country in 1922. However, he wasn't even able to form a strong government in the south because of resistance from other local warlords. As historian James Sheridan explained, the nature of the warlord era meant that such ambitious goals were all but impossible. The leader of a clique might hope to unify the country, but he stood alone, on quicksand. Not only did each clique leader have a simplistic notion of unity, but the attainment of his goal threatened his supporters as much as their enemies, for the fulfillment of his power dreams would entail the loss of their independence, the very essence of their position as warlords. One of the few certainties in China in 1921 is that there would be a lot more fighting to come before the age of the warlord would come to an end. Now, covering events like the Age of the Warlords in China and poets like the Dog Meat General yeah. is a lot of fun for us here at the Great War Team, but it does come with its challenges as well. Frankly speaking, history is a bit of a niche topic in the scheme of YouTube's grand reach, and YouTube's policies haven't made it that much easier for history creators like us to create detailed and hopefully objective of history content for all of you. That's why we crowdfunded and released our Battle of Berlin Duck. Okay, that's the end of that. Oh my god. Oh my god. They said it was fun. I don't know. I see all the pain and all of the things that the emotions, you know, human emotions, you know, it's not something you should be playing with. It's not something anybody of any time of any history can play with. Human emotions are really, really strong. So yeah, those poets and I, I can feel, I understand like their feeling and their emotions. And you know, I'd love to say God bless them, but I'm an atheist, and they're probably you know they're probably no more anymore. I guess it was sort of a long time ago. But yeah, it's these leaders, their mistakes result in a lot of things. There's a story I want to share and then I'll end this video, which is, um, well, it's not my story. It's a story that an actor said in my language on stage. And I just wanted to share that story with you. So there was a king in a, in a, in a village and what he, he had everything at home. They're cooking this big meal because there's a king from another village is coming to visit him. So he looked around the house and what he said was, Hey, um, the cooks, they all looked and they realized they didn't have any salt. So the king uh, called one of his people and he's like, uh, yeah, go into that shop and go get the salt. He came back and he just went, he, he went to get the salt and he realized that he didn't take any money. So the king went, chased up on him and caught him and he said, hey, you forgot to take some money to go buy uh, the salt. And, and what he said is, you're, we're, we're the king, so we didn't, I don't think we need to give the money. You know, we don't need to pay because we're in power. 
both you are in power so you know and i can go and say that and get the money and you're like we can't do it like that no 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 because today if i tell you to buy something this is the king saying this if i tell you to buy something and you know i'm the king i don't need to pay money tomorrow you'll be like hey i'm the king's you know worker i don't need to pay money and then tomorrow the king's driver hey i don't need to pay money and then it goes on and on and on and on and then this would be a chain reaction and it would be a freaking Fibonacci sequence and eventually there'll be a whole group of people that won't pay money so if I pay money right now that changes that breaks that chain that chain wouldn't even exist and you know we, we could break it from there and everybody will be right so if to for a place to have the right sort of people it comes from a right sort of leader or king you know and the qualities of a leader is not just someone who you know tells his crew what to do if he was on a ship and the ship was about to sink and one person had to die and he the guy who jumps out and sacrifices his life to save the rest and for their families that's the quality of a leader so as long as the leaders do their job right the like leaders you know are, are correct in the way they are that's how everybody else can follow that. That's the right sort of influence. That's the right sort of example that needs to be there. That's just something I just like to share with you and a feeling that was in my heart for a while. But hey. Thank you. No, thanks so much for watching, man. If you enjoyed this video, pretty long video, but hey, if you enjoyed this video, let me know down in the comments below. Let me know what else you want me to react to. It could be anything. History, science, geography, anything, anything, anything fun, anything educational. I am really enjoying learning things. So hey, give me, give me some more things to learn from. Anything you want, let me know down in the comments below. I love you all. You're amazing. You're all awesome. Stay home. Stay safe. Stay blessed. Stay awesome, my little dragons. And I will see you all in the next video.